If we had known then what we know now, the invasion of Iraq would have been stopped by a popular outcry." Unquote. This amazing admission was saying, in effect, that journalists had betrayed the public by not doing their job and by accepting and amplifying and echoing the lives of Bush and his gang instead of challenging and exposing them. What the Times didn't say was that had that paper and the rest of the media exposed the lies, up to a million people might be alive today. That's the belief now of a number of senior establishment journalists. Few of them, they've spoken to me about it, few of them will say it in public. Ironically, I began to understand how censorship worked in so-called free societies when I reported from totalitarian societies. During the 1970s, I filmed secretly in Czechoslovakia, then a Stalinist dictatorship. I interviewed members of the dissident group Charter 77, including the novelist Zednady Urbanik, and this is what he told me. I quote him. In dictatorships, we are more fortunate than you in the West in one respect. We believe nothing of what we read in the newspapers <laughs> and nothing of what we watch on television because we know it's propaganda and lies. Unlike you in the West, we've learned to look behind the propaganda and to read between the lines. Unlike you, we know that the real truth is always subversive. Bandana Shiva has called this subjugated knowledge. The great Irish muckraker Claude Coburn got it right when he wrote, never believe anything until it's officially denied. One of the oldest cliches of war is that truth is the first casualty. No, it's not. Journalism is the first casualty. When the Vietnam War was over, the magazine Encounter published an article by Robert Elegant, a distinguished correspondent who had covered the war. For the first time in modern history, he wrote, the outcome of a war was, de de was determined not on the battlefield, but on the printed page, and above all, on the television screen. He held journalists responsible for losing the war by opposing it in their reporting. Robert Elegant's view became the received wisdom in Washington, and it still is. In Iraq, the Pentagon invented the embedded journalist because it believed that critical reporting had lost Vietnam. The very opposite was true. On my first day as a young reporter in Saigon, I called at the bureaus of, main, <coughs> of the main newspapers and TV companies. I noticed that some of them had a pinboard on the wall on which were gruesome photographs, mostly of bodies of Vietnamese and of American soldiers holding up severed ears and testicles. In one office was a photograph of a man being tortured Above the torturer's head was a stick-on comic balloon with the words, that'll teach you to talk to the press. None of these pictures were ever published or even put on the wire. I asked why. I was told that the public would never accept them. Anyway, to publish them would not be objective or impartial. At first, I accepted the apparent logic of this. I, too, had grown up on stories of the good war against Germany and Japan, that ethical bath that cleansed the Anglo-American Anglo world of all evil. But the longer I stayed in Vietnam, the more I realized that our atrocities were not isolated, nor were they aberrations, that the war itself was an atrocity. That was the big story, and it was seldom news. Yes, the tactics and effectiveness of the military were questioned by some very fine reporters. 
but the word invasion was never used. The anodyne word used was involved. America was involved in Vietnam. The fiction of a well-intentioned, blundering giant stuck in an Asian quagmire was repeated incessantly. It was left to whistleblowers back home to tell the subversive truth. Those like Daniel Ellsberg and Seymour Hirsch with his scoop of the My Lai massacre. There were 649 reporters in Vietnam on March the 16th, 1968, the day that the My Lai massacre happened. Not one of them reported it. In both Vietnam and Iraq, deliberate policies and strategies have bordered on genocide. In Vietnam, the forced dispossession of millions of people and the creation of free fire zones. In Iraq, an American enforced embargo that ran through the 1990s like a medieval siege and killed, according to the United Nations Children's Fund, at least half a million children under the age of five. In both Vietnam and Iraq, banned weapons were used against civilians as deliberate experiments. Agent Orange changed, changed the genetic and environmental order in Vietnam. The military called this Operation Hades. When Congress found out, it was renamed the friendlier Operation Ranch Hand, and nothing changed. That's pretty much the way Congress has reacted to the war in, in Iraq. The Democrats have damned it, rebranded it, and extended it. The Hollywood movies that followed the Vietnam War were an extension of the journalism, of normalizing the unthinkable. Yes, some of the movies were critical of the military's tactics, but all of them were careful to concentrate on the angst of the invaders. The first of these movies is now considered a classic. It's the deer hunter whose message was that America had suffered, America was stricken, American boys had done their best against Oriental barbarians. The message was all the more pernicious because the deer hunter was brilliantly made and acted. I have to admit it's the only movie that has made me shout out loud in a cinema in protest. Oliver Stone's acclaimed movie, Platoon, was said to be anti-war, and it did show glimpses of the Vietnamese as human beings, but it also promoted, above all, the American invader as victim. I wasn't going to mention uh, the Green Berets when I sat down to write this, <laughs> until I read the other day that John Wayne was the most influential movie star who ever lived. I saw the Green Berets starring John Wayne on a Saturday night in 1968 in Montgomery, Alabama. I was down there to uh, interview uh, the then infamous governor, George Wallace. <clears throat> and I'd just come back from Vietnam and I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how absurd this movie was. So I laughed out loud. <laughs> I laughed and laughed. And it wasn't long before the atmosphere around me grew very cold. <laughs> My companion, who'd been a freedom rider in the South, whispered, let's get the hell out of here and run, <laughs> and, and run like hell. Well, we were chased all the way back to our hotel. But I doubt if any of my pursuers were aware that John Wayne, their hero, had lied so that he wouldn't have to fight in World War II. And yet the phony role model of Wayne sent thousands of young Americans to their deaths in Vietnam, with the notable exceptions of George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. <laughs> Last year, in his acceptance of the Nobel Prize for Literature, the playwright Harold Pinter made an epic speech. 